Well, the pandemic has had a particularly dire impact on the education calendar in the country. And uh, Equal Education says that it is worried that uh, the National School Nutrition Program is still not reaching learners on uh, the days that uh, they, are not, uh, they are at home because of uh, rotating timetables. Right, to unpack this uh, further, we're now joined uh, via Zoom by the Secretary, uh, General Secretary of Equal Education, uh, Non Nebo Matube Tube. Non Nebo, always a pleasure to have you here here with us on uh, SABC News. Thank you for joining us. Thank you so much for having us. You know, it seems every time you and I have a discussion, we are sort of raising the same sort of issues. And I'm, and I'm wondering if you're just not uh, getting uh, the kind of hearing that uh, you're looking for uh, from a government, from those who are responsible uh, in terms of implementing certain measures so that we don't see a situation where I'm reading here nearly 2 million learners still not receiving uh, school meals. I can imagine that that can be very frustrating uh, uh, for you as uh, equal education that these are the kind of issues that we've really kind of spoken about quite a bit this year isn't it mm. look I, it's interesting to come onto the show on the back of isabel because yeah. i've already said to folk that we discuss and advocate for the school nutrition program on the backdrop of a humanitarian crisis of food insecurity in our country. And so when, when we advocate for children and learners to get a daily nutritious meal through the National School Nutrition Program, it is because we understand that there are high levels and growing uh, high levels of poverty and hunger in poor and working class communities across the country. Mm -hmm. And children are experiencing that two or three times fold as a result of being an extremely marginalized group um, of pe people in our society. Uh, and I, I think during the process of going to court around the school nutrition program, the arguments for the state in, to some extent were that the school nutrition program cannot be reinstated because of COVID regulations. And in fact, the, the business of feeding children isn't an entirely the DBEs or the Department of Basic Education rather's mm. um, sort of mandate. Theirs is what happens inside the classroom. Right. And so that's when our argument started to say, look, education is a holistic service to children. And so learners, we found, go to school because they know they will access at least one nutritious meal a day. And, and so this program is crucial in ensuring that um, learners are fed, healthy, vital, and can combat things like pandemic viruses, um, given the case, but also to assist them in being able to learn um, uh, far better um, because of, of concentration and, and nutrition and, and, and things of that nature. So that's the one thing that we've been advocating for, the basis of, of, our, of our campaigns and our struggle. Mm. But what has happened now is that the, the court order that the the state and the government had received post um, the victory on the school nutrition uh, program uh, had stated that departments of education across uh, the provinces need to report to the courts and to us every 15 days the status and progress that they are making with feeding learners. And what we've learned in the last couple of weeks is that learners are on a rotation system at school to ensure that there is levels of uh, physical and social distancing. Mm. But learners that are at home then don't have access to this and what we've been asking them is for is, is, is for folks to give us a cogency plan that's look in the event that learners rotate in and out of schools yeah. how are they going to be fed in the days that they don't go to school some learners have said to us we aren't able to go to school because we don't have access to scholar transport and we've said to the, to the department over and over again why don't you use the infrastructure of the scholar transport to take food to yeah. learners so that they can pick it up at their nearest bus stops? And, and the and other thing that we've recommended is that the departments consider food parcels as opposed to hot meals yeah. so that learners can eat at home on the days that they aren't at school. And I mean, this 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 issue of uh, rotating uh, timetables, obviously not uh, to, to spread the virus. Now that we are on uh, level one, are you perhaps having more engagements about uh, the fact that uh, maybe things should uh, continue as well you know we all talk about the new normal uh, things should go back perhaps to 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 normalcy really because i mean as you say it's not sustainable uh, that perhaps a child is only coming into school now uh, twice as opposed to five times which then means uh, that they're then getting that nutritious meal only twice so i wonder if uh, perhaps there are then um 
you know, these are also infrastructural uh, issues then to kind of look at if we're looking at the issue yeah. of nutrition. This then also means perhaps maybe looking at um, uh, more spacing of, of, of children and not having uh, the learners so cramped up in some of these schools um, as, as they are. So, you know, when you talk yeah. about approaching this in a holistic way, that then also means perhaps then also uh, 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 looking at, at, at what the school structure is actually looking like um, in, in, in the first place because, you know, you, you, you have to balance the issue of of making sure that the learners uh, get a meal, but also not being so highly at risk of, of, of contracting COVID-19. So a number of issues then at play, right, non -Nebo? Yeah. Look, I, I think we should continue uh, with, with the rotation system. And the reason for that, and I'm sure your, your, your input now has touched the studios of all of the school communities that we work with the least, because overcrowding is a major challenge inside rural and township schools. And so even if they were to go back to the previous normal, that, that means that their classrooms would have 70 plus learners at a time. And the, I don't know, the, the precautions that have been put in place to, to keep the contraction of COVID at a low uh, sort of levels aren't just for learners. They're also, also for teachers and adult staff um, that uh, are inside those schools. So it's important to, to keep these kinds of precautions in place while we're still sort of navigating the potential of a second wave, for instance, of the spread of, of the COVID uh, sort of virus. So I think we should keep this rotation system as best as we can and mm. keep learners uh, physically distanced because that isn't the reality in our schools. If we go back to um, what, what was before COVID, it, it would be disastrous, uh, the conditions we, we yeah. would find in, in those schools. And so, I, I mean, that, that's a separate issue on infrastructure. And I do want the country to know that when we had asked the Department of Basic Education about their plans to ensure additional classrooms and teachers inside schools, they had said, look, the ability for us to be able to put um, additional classrooms in schools now, even if it's uh, temporary structures or prefabricated classrooms, is, 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 is highly unlikely. Yeah. Um, so that isn't something that we're expecting the government to be able to do. And because there's been an over 2.2 billion rand decrease in the infrastructure budget in particular, um, during this COVID period for, from education. So a lot of money has been lost to um, other departments like the South African Police Services uh, and money has been given to the South African National Defense Force and taken from education, which is a social service, another thing that we should be concerned about. Uh, and so there will be less money to provide those kinds of sort of spaces and alleviations um, inside our own school communities at least. And, and, and the one thing I do want to say to folk, if they could please just go and the schools in the 80s are in fact feeding learners. Ask the question around, are learners that aren't at school being welcomed to come in and food? Push the school management teams, the district officers to give you this kind of information because we're finding that provinces are, are quite frankly unaccountable mm. um, to not being able to put these alternatives or contingencies into place. And the departments have said nothing about if level two does, um, not level two, um, a second wave, does come about of the pandemic. What is the plan from the department? Because, I mean, at the moment, they are feeding more learners because more learners have been led back into school and mm -hmm. the alert levels have been sort of relaxed. What happens when we go back to a, a situation of level three and four? Does that mean then children go hungry again? Yeah, and, and that's, that's, and that's actually where, have. That's where I wanted to go. Uh, in fact, I think that uh, you anticipated uh, my next uh, question. The letter to DBE asking uh, whether there is a plan uh, in place, um, you know, should, of course, South Africa experience a second wave. So, you know, you are preempting something that could possibly be a, a reality in our country um, if there is that uh, second wave of uh, COVID-19. Uh, have you kind of received some kind of um, answer to that in terms of um, what would happen? And I suppose nobody, nobody wants to anticipate the fact that uh, there could be a, a second wave, but it is unfortunately uh, the reality. Has there been some kind of a response from, from a DBE relating to any kind of action plan that should actually be now uh, looked into yeah no no they have they haven't responded in that vein or to that letter at all so we're still awaiting that another thing is that i would encourage folk watching to follow us on all socials together with the equal education law center and section 27 and help us push um, and apply pressure to the departments to respond to these kinds of critical questions um so that we aren't on the backdrop or on the back foot again um once we experience our second wave and look gl global trends show us that we might get some inst like sort of formation of, of a second wave and, and, and our schools and learners inside already marginalized communities can't be the the folks that suffer the most yeah. um uh, uh, sort of in that instance and that's and that's what we we worried about but we we aren't going to stop advocating 
targeting and applying pressure to these departments um, and we'll keep making sure that the Okay, unfortunately, we are. Translate to the experience of learners on the ground. Yeah, unfortunately, we're out of time and we are seeming to be uh, losing you there. But uh, thank you very much uh, for giving us uh, your time, as always. Nongleto Matubedube, who is the General Secretary of uh, Equal Education, joining us there via Zoom.